Your Excellency, Uncle Charlie Madden, Fellows of International House, Members of Council past and present, International House alumni, residents, staff and many, many distinguished guests. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you our guest speaker for today, the Honourable Michael Kirby, Companion of the Order of Australia, Companion of the Order of St Michael and St George. Michael Kirby attended Fort Street High School in Sydney. He received bachelor's degrees in arts, law and economics and a master of laws with first class honours from the University of Sydney. While at Sydney, he was president of the Students' Representative Council in 1962 and 63 and president of the Sydney University Union in 1965. This means that he was a student here and an office holder with the SRC and the Union during the years that International House was being planned and built. And I have a suspicion that he may have had some involvement in the very enterprising fundraising activities that David Shannon outlined for us yesterday evening. Michael Kirby was admitted to the New South Wales Bar in 67 and appointed in 1975 as Deputy President of the Australian Conciliation and Arbitration Commission. From 1975 to 1984, he was the inaugural chairman of the Australian Law Reform Commission. Later, he was appointed a judge of the Federal Court of Australia, president of the New South Wales Court of Appeal and concurrently the Court of Appeal of the Solomon Islands. His appointment to the High Court came in 1996, where he served for 13 years. In later years, he was acting Chief Justice of Australia twice. Michael was appointed Companion of the Order of St Michael and St George on the 31st of December 82 for his services to the law. He was made a Companion of the Order of Australia in 1991 and in the same year was awarded the Human Rights Medal. In addition to his judicial duties, Michael served on three university governing bodies, including as Chancellor of Macquarie University from 1984 to 93. He has served on many national and international bodies, including the World Health Organization's Global Commission on AIDS, President of the International Commission of Jurists in Geneva, as UN Special Representative of Human Rights in Cambodia, and a member of the UNESCO International Bioethics Committee. Michael currently serves as a member of the High Commission for Human Rights Judicial Reference Group and a member of the UN AIDS Reference Group on HIV and Human Rights. Since his retirement, he has, was elected President of the Institute of Arbitrators and Mediators uh, in Australia and serves as Editor-in-Chief of the Laws of Australia. He's been appointed Honorary Visiting Professor by 12 universities and has been awarded 20 honorary degrees. In 2010, Michael was awarded the Gruber Justice Prize. He's a member of the Eminent Persons Group, which is investigating the future of the Commonwealth of Nations and has been appointed to the UNDP Global Commission of HIV and the Law. In 2010, he was appointed the Arbitration Panel of the International Centre for Settlement of Investment Disputes with the World Bank. And in his spare time, he's able to come and speak to us at International House, for which we're very grateful. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce your guest speaker, the Honourable Michael Kirby, AC CNG. Your Excellency, the Administrator of the Commonwealth, our beloved Governor and our beloved Chancellor, aren't we lucky to have uh, Marie Bashir as our Chancellor? Denise North um, and uh, Jessica Carroll and current uh, officers of uh, International House. Uh, and I too acknowledge Graham de Graaf uh, and uh, Loris Elms. Loris Elms, uh, Graham, you're always with me too, but Loris is in my ear and in my iPod uh, wherever I am travelling and I, I get rid of the others and these new also-rans and I go straight to Loris's wonderful voice and how blessed International House has been to have those two as founders and constant friends uh, and uh, it's been a wonderful journey uh, and I express as a citizen thanks to Graham and thanks to Loris and thanks to all those who have uh, served on the council and in the uh, staff and administration of uh, International House. I also acknowledge uh, Chica Madden uh, and I acknowledge the current uh, students who are living in the house and I speak for the international students who have 
been here and been part of the spirit of this place. In a sense, they've been part of the vibes. As you know, High Court judges are very good with vibes and we feel the vibes of everything and in this place are the vibes of all of those who have passed through uh, this wonderful institution. Now, um, I think I was chosen to speak because of the fact that I am a sort of ancient link to the very time when International House was established. Uh, and um, I share, although I never was a resident here, I certainly have come very many times to this place and to this beautiful uh, hall. Uh, and in the papers of my father, who died last November, I found a wonderful issue of the Union Recorder, uh, which uh, was issued uh, at the very time uh, in the very month when uh, International House got going. And it has a marvellous photograph of this rotunda in the front, uh, and it has also a lovely photo of it um, uh, on the page three, and a marvellous um, essay, uh, A Freshman's Guide to International House. Mind you, it was freshman in those days, very politically incorrect. Freshman's Guide to International House, uh, University of Sydney, and it's by uh, Mrs. Rosalie McCutcheon, uh, Deputy Director of International House. And I'm going to present this uh, when I finish these remarks uh, to uh, International House to be kept with the records. No doubt it's somewhere around, hanging around, but this is uh, a record of that very time. It was a time when I uh, was serving as president of the Sydney University Union. I had been uh, twice the president of the Students' Representative Council, uh, and I was about to begin my term as uh, a Fellow of the Senate uh, representing the undergraduates, uh, but more importantly in the volume is a picture of a very young Geoffrey Robertson. Now the Geoffrey Robertson QC, he had just been elected to be the president of the uh, SRC of the University of Sydney. There's a, a, a statement of the goings-on at Union Night where a very young Alan Cameron was uh, <laughs> debating and uh, upholding uh, the right and the good, as he always does. Uh, Jim Poulos, they're all QCs or SCs now. They've all become respectable. We've all become respectable. But in those days, we were a lot of troublemakers. <laughs> we were a lot of stirrers. And in my case, I've never been able really to shake off the stirring business. Now, I don't wish to appear bitter about university colleges. <laughs> But I applied uh, on the suggestion uh, of the almoner of the university. Chancellor, I don't know if the university still has an almoner, A-L-M-O-N-E-R. The almoner was a person who helped boys from poorer families, which is what I was, to uh, find a place in the university. And I applied to the Reverend Wiley to be a... a, a a student member and bursary holder of Wesley College. It's just over there, those of you who <laughs> don't know. And I was accepted, uh, and uh, I was all ready to become uh, a Wesleyite, uh, and I was quite happy about that because as a boy I'd gone up the top of the street to the Wesley Methodist Church at Concord in Sydney, uh, and at that church, I'd learned all the wonderful Wesleyan hymns and, uh, and uh, the very practical, hands-on, help-it-all uh, attitude of the, of the Wesleyan Methodists. But they had a rule of the trusteeship that if a Methodist minister's son applied for the scholarship, then that bumped out the person who, on his merits <laughs> and on his leaving certificate results, had got into Wesley Methodist College of the University of Sydney. So I, who was about to start there, 
uh, was bumped out and I never attended a college and I never attended this house and I am just a little bit resentful of the fact. <laughs> but uh, it was a, an aspect of life that I missed out on. But in the way these things work out, I was sending vibes through the mail and through the ether down to Melbourne uh, where, uh, so, not soon after, but a decade after, a very young Graham de Graaf was about to enter the equivalent of the Methodist College here, Queen's College and the University of Melbourne, in order to become a student. And he got in. Uh, no doubt his parents had more moolah than my parents. <laughs> Uh, and uh, he uh, then later brought uh, the same spirit to International House, but with a difference. Uh, and uh, I suspect that I've been asked to speak because I was there when this idea was germinating and when the notion was being developed to create uh, a, an International House at the uh, University of Sydney. Uh, as we all know, there had been such a house in New York, created in the 1920s. And that's a very interesting story uh, of Harry Edmonds, who said good morning to a couple of Chinese students, and they stopped in their tracks and said, no one, we've been in this city for three weeks, and no one has spoken to us in that time. And that would, is what gave him an idea to establish a place where people would speak to each other and would speak to them a human being to human being and friend to friend and uh, that was an original notion and that was the notion that was about at the time when I was a student troublemaker and when the idea of International House was being formulated. Now um, a very great spirit walked across the stage at that time, and it was Harold Mays. Now, Daphne Cock and I are old enough. I said Daphne was much younger, much younger, and she's wearing this gorgeous uh, cardinal pink uh, outfit today. But Daphne and I are old enough to remember uh, Harold Mays, and he was a remarkable man. He was a very difficult man. Uh, he was a man who, when he got a bee in his bonnet, it happened, and he got the things done. But if you crossed his path, that wasn't a good career move. <laughs> <laughs> and he uh, was the man who uh, the Vice-Chancellor, surrounded in smoke, uh, uh, which was uh, Sir Stephen Roberts, uh, asked to get uh, involved in the planning of uh, international House. Now, um, he, he had to overcome some resistance. Some of the resistance was of the very notion of a university as being a university of colleges which had been founded by mostly by Christian churches. Uh, and the idea that that is what you should have and that's what you should go on having. Uh, that was theory number one. Theory number two was a theory which was being put about by a person of equal um, human force, a force of nature, Sir Philip Baxter. Baxter was the Vice-Chancellor at the University of New South Wales and a lot is owed to Philip Baxter for the creation of the University of New South Wales and his notion was you should have a very cut price body uh, with very cheap student accommodation. Uh, no food should be supplied because they'll forever be complaining about it. So they should be made to go outside. Uh, why are you all nodding your heads for? Uh, and you should all have to buy your food at the student accommodation uh, for the students generally in the university and not bother us with your complaints about the food. That was the Baxterian model. Baxter said it's a very dangerous idea to cre create uh, any institution where there are common rooms because that is where the students will foregather 
and will cause trouble. And they'll have lots of uh, talk and lots of discussion and they'll cause a lot of trouble. Now, this wasn't a completely idiosyncratic view of Baxter's. It was basically a fundamental British idea. The British, if you look at the cities of the empire, almost always they didn't have a big open space because open spaces are where people can gather and cause trouble. <laughs> the French, in their folly, created these great, magnificent open spaces and the French colonialists lived to rue the day because the people got together. Well, Baxter's view was don't have open spaces, don't have places where people can congregate because they'll only get to trouble. But that wasn't Mays's idea. Mays's idea was to create uh, uh, um, an, an institution uh, which would bring together people who were from Australia and from... Uh, uh, the international community, particularly surrounding Australia. Now, I have to say to you, reading this book, Passing the Light, which is a marvellous story of uh, International House and which, if I may, I'm going to pass around the tables and every one of us here present should sign it and it should go into the archives of International House as a record of us who gathered to celebrate the 45th anniversary. But... Uh, if you read this book, and if you've been through what I and later Daphne went through of the ethos of those days, you have a rather unpleasant reminder of the degree of racism uh, and the degree of superiority, which was very common in Australia of that time. It wasn't nasty and it wasn't cruel, deliberately, but there was an element of it that wasn't right. And I know, because I was in the Student Representative Council, I have to confess, I was a fairly orthodox student politician. That's why I was so successful. I was sort of, uh, I looked radical, but I wasn't too dangerous. <laughs> Maybe they're still trying to be like that, Chancellor, but... In those days, I, I wasn't very avant-garde, but there were people, and I'm thinking of Peter Walensky, who was the president of the SRC two before me. He was really forward-looking. Maybe that was because his family had come as refugees to Australia from Poland. They were Polish Jews, and only their removal saved his life. But uh, Peter Walensky had a lot of big ideas for Australia and he planted them in the SRC and one of them was International House. And the SRC in his time, uh, in 1950, uh, 1958, 59, 60, became a great supporter of and indeed one of the main agitators for uh, International House. But Peter Walensky had more in his mind. He started to try to talk to us about Aboriginals. Now, not many people in those days talked about the rights of Aboriginals. It's amazing, if we look back on it, that we as a society were quite complacent about uh, Aboriginals. Uh, we, we, they disappeared, we didn't know them, and not much was done, and we hadn't really had an Aboriginal graduate in the university system. Uh, and so Peter Walensky and those around him and then later people like me supported ABSCOL and the idea of an ab uh, scholarships for Aboriginals so that we could rectify that neglect and started to talk about the rights of Aboriginals and their rights, for example, to land uh, and to uh, education and to housing and to health. And that became a very important theme at that time. And it's been woven into the story of International House. Another thing Peter was strong on, and Daphne will remember this, he was very strong at that time, and the students came behind him eventually on women's rights, on the fact that women were not only useful, uh, as this book says, to be the women's committee and make cups of tea, that women actually had brains 
and that women actually ha had a real intellectual contribution to make. And they suffered many glass ceilings and many, uh, many obstacles, and still do. And that was a very important uh, aspect of Peter's leadership. And thirdly, uh, he was very strong on white Australia. Don't forget, white Australia lasted in the law of this country till 1966. So coinciding with the start of International House was white Australia. When I was at Ford Street High School, a wonderful public school, uh, in the whole school there were, I think, about six Asian Australians. One of them was John New, who went on to become Australian of the Year a great paediatrician and a great doctor and uh, a great communicator, very important Australian. Uh, but there weren't many. When I go back to Ford Street now, 40, 50 per cent of the school is Asian Australians uh, and probably more. And this is the change that has come over our country. That is a big change from the ethos that's recorded in this book and from the attitudes of Australia that were present when this house uh, put up a shingle and opened for business. And I have to say the original ideas were often some slightly condescending ones, that we, the leaders of the world, the intellectual leaders, we out of our great mercy will invite others into our presence so that a little bit of our gold will rub off onto, onto them. And that was just a different attitude completely to the attitude of today. And if that, it's, I mean, I'm not saying it's entirely different in the community, but it's entirely different in the intellectual community and the university community and in this house. And a lot of credit has to be given to the leadership and foresight of people like Graham de Graaf who saw the error of that attitude that, and that that wasn't a good space and who created this place as a place of true equality and of true friendship and of true collegiality uh, and a true place for women as well as men and for Australians born here, for Australians coming here and for others who... Uh, go back to their countries and remain our friends. So I think it's a, it's a truly marvellous story of transition. But I've got one last thing to say. My experience looking back and looking at the university and the society and the intellectual society at that time causes me to remember that back in those days nobody talked about gays. Nobody talked about equality for sexual minorities. Nobody talked about the rights of homosexuals, including little me. Nobody talked about these things. And the denigration, humiliation and disadvantage and criminalisation was just accepted. And inequality was just accepted, as in some places in our fair land it still is. And that has to change, just as our attitude to Aboriginals had to change, to women had to change, uh, to Asian and other people of different uh, ethnicity had to change, so our attitude to sexual minorities has to change. And it'll only change if people say it and confront us with error and ensure that things do change. And that really is the challenge for International House. And I know in this program today we're going to look into the future uh, and uh, that future will be opening up new vistas that we haven't really thought about, even today. All these brilliant people who are here, there are things which in 30 years' time they'll say, how could you not have seen that they are uh, issues of inequality and injustice? So... That's where International House uh, will be and it still has that role to be opening new doors, opening new vistas 
seen things and saying what is seen. Um, W.B. Yeats said it all in one of his poems with those brilliant images he has. Once out of nature, I shall never take my bodily form from any mortal thing, but such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make of hammered gold and gold enamelling to set a drowsy emperor awake or put upon a golden bough to sing to lords and ladies of Byzantium of what is past, passing, or to come. What is past, we can learn from it. What is passing, we can contribute to it. What is to come, we have to see, predict, and make sure that it's a good future and a future that goes on doing the good things that International House has uh, done in its 45 years to date. Uh, and I hope I'm going to be around, maybe not for another 45 years, but certainly for a very long time to witness the achievements of this House. So to the spirits of those who have been here, to those who are still here and those who are to come, respects, congratulations, but we have great expectations. Excellency, the Honourable Mr Kirby and Director Jessica and all of you who love International House. Um, I know the reason that you were invited to speak here this morning, at least I thought I did. It was because it's Sunday morning and a lot of us remember the time when if you wanted anything other than sports information on a Sunday morning, you would hope that the chairman of the Law Reform Commission was making one of his statements because he always chose to release them on a Sunday because he cannily knew that there was nothing else anybody with any interest could read. But I was obviously wrong. He was asked because he um, has got the point about International House. Um, I thought you were here at the official opening. I thought in your capacity as president of the SRC, you were sitting just about there, except that we were all about 20 feet further back because the room was busier then. Um, but you would remember if you had been. I um, have very strange memories of that original opening. I'm allowed to be an old man um, since last night, so I'm allowed to meander on for a little while, but I won't go too long. I'll just be careful not to get Loris's or Jessica's eye. Um, <laughs> Very strange memories. I didn't think much about an official opening, but um, I was much more concerned with getting the place going and trying to be sure that it was the sort of place that the people for whom it was intended would find welcoming. And that meant unpicking a lot of what was the tradition for collegiate residents in this university, not just for the sake of it, but because it had all, it was everything was wrong. Um, two years before the place existed, Bob Bland, who was sitting here somewhere, was showing me the, the plans that Walter Bunning already had for what this building was going to be like. And I think he was a bit horrified that sort of while he was just showing them to me, I think it was even before I was actually appointed, I, with a pencil I was crossing out things like senior common room and writing sitting room, crossing out things like dais in the um, dining room and saying, no, we won't have that. Uh, and um, this had been, I'm afraid, my attitude right through. And Harold Mays, after we'd been going for a few months, said, you know, we've got to have an official opening. And he said, the Rotarians need to be thanked for their slog for the last five years. The university needs to acknowledge them, and um, we need to make our presence felt on the university. So he said, we'd better organise an official opening. Um, and he said, when he obviously realised that this twit that he'd appointed as a director didn't sort of get that, he said, I think I'd better get the registrar in my department to look after this for you. You're a bit busy. Um, and 
that was done, a date was fixed, and beautiful furniture from the Vice Chancellor's office appeared here, and and so on. Um, and he said, uh, "This will be the program." Incidentally, when it was over and I was um, reflecting on it with him, I said, "It was amazing." There were several speakers there. They didn't overlap at all. They all said the right things. And it was a miracle. And he looked at me and he said, oh, well, these are busy people. And he said, a few days beforehand, I always send a few notes down to Government House and such places. <laughs> ah, yes. But, um, he said to me, now, the Governor's coming. He needs to be looked after properly. Have you got the Vice Regal salute? which, of course, I didn't know what he was talking about, but that was produced, and um, the machine even, even worked. And he said, there are going to be a big crowd of people in the wool room, and you're going to have afternoon tea down in the basement. What arrangements have you made for the governor? And um, I said, oh, well, I'll get somebody to hold the lift. He, and <laughs> he, foolish man, relaxed and thought that, oh, well, you'll be able to look after that bit. Well... Um, saving your presence, Excellency, it's a wonder I wasn't sent to Norfolk Island. <laughs> it was a shambles. Um, but the governor, who was a dignified man, by the time he left, he said, this is going to be a very happy place. And about that, he was right. I think that the House has succeeded in many of its aims. I'm full of admiration for the way Jessica does the things that I never found the right way of doing, and she seems to do it so effortlessly. The atmosphere in the house when you walk in is always still the same, very happy, happy atmosphere. There's one thing that distresses me, and that is that I see fewer Australian students around than there used to be, and the importance of the place is that there should be what we thought at the time, an equal number of Australian students with overseas students to make the thing really work. And the notion of a scholarship that's now going to be a full scholarship and available to an Australian student cheers me hugely because not only will that bring at least one student in, but it will change the whole atmosphere in terms of Australian students perhaps out in the country um, who would have thought they can't possibly be um, candidates for International House. Knowing that there is that possibility will inquire, and if they don't get that scholarship, they may well then have caught the vision of the place and find other ways of achieving it. But I really am rambling. Thank you so much, Michael, for your, your talk. I now know the real reason you were asked to come. <laughs> Thank you so much.